from all over the world who were there. They were all kind of tense. There were, it was actually a living village that uh, was happening there. And in the process of them needing supplies, many of the other tribes who had formerly not been overly friendly because of the westward expansion uh, were doing marvelous stuff there. They would, uh, well, for instance, the Ho-Chunk, and they, they brought truckloads of wood to burn for fires. Uh, the uh, tr tribe down south, um, Cherokee, they brought truckloads of water. And there were these warehouses that people could go if they didn't have clothes, didn't have water, and they could, you know, eat and drink and be a part of that. And the people there were very uh, well organized. Uh, there was dumpsters. Recycling was happening. Well, in the meantime, on the other side, uh, this was on a reservation land, uh, they had these attack dogs, and again, these people that had masks over their face. And we were heavily armed. I want to tell you the truth. We were heavily armed with prayers and drums. Prayers and drums. So the women were out one night, and they're, they're saying prayers, and they're beating the drum. And they decided they were going to set the attack dogs on the women. And if I said the women got chewed up, that would be underestimating. Uh, I still have a hard time talking about that. And later on that evening, there was one of the girls who was in the front there, and, and she lifted her front up. You could see how badly, you know, those, those dogs had hurt her. Um, there was another woman there that had, uh, again, she was praying uh, on their side too, some kind of a concussion, concussion grenade, rather, and blew her arm off. During, uh, now we were only there a little short time, a few days, but most of the people were there for months. And because the weather out there is uh, really cold during the winter, what they would do is they would drive the, these trucks that have water cannons on, and they would hose the people down. They'd hose your tent down. Now, can you imagine if you're way out in the plains, there's no house, there's no place to go, you're soaked to the bone, your, your, your clothes are wet, your tent is wet, and how long are you going to be able to take that? Um, I know at one time up on the ridge, up on the ridge, they had three unmarked tanks. Now, again, I'm talking about America. How do you have three unmarked tanks wandering around the reservation land in America? Something wrong with that. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because what you do to one color, potentially, you can do to any color. Uh, and that's where the problem is. We have to be very vigilant continually that our rights are not eroded away further than what they already are and, and what what I fear is coming in the future. We have to be vigilant. You know, for us to be, uh, have the power of prayer is a powerful thing. And I don't care what religion you are. I've often had many elders tell me, if you pray from the heart, there's no wrong way. You know, if it's got a good spirit, creator will bless you. You know, and I believe that. Now, it may surprise you, and I'm very traditional in the way I was brought up and, and my thoughts on that, but I'm also a Methodist. So, <laughs> So I'm a combination of, of many things, and uh, I learned from many different elders who have taught me, taught me good things over the years, you know, and one of the elders that I kind of admire in a certain, certain way is Gandhi, you know. We must be that change we hope to see. We are that change. If we're not good, we're not going to project good. We, each one of us has to be a beacon, you know, and uh, I'm going to get married this year, and I'm, I'm, she often reminds me what I often say is that woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know, and we have many choices that we can do with our life, you know, and we don't. You know, sometimes we just sit there, we kind of waste day by day, and we don't, you know, have a say in what's going on. We should have a say. You know, our churches, no matter what faith, they should be packed. If ever we need to have churches packed, it's right now. You know, with stuff that's going on in the world and... You know, this threat of nuclear, whatever's going on, you know, you know, we need to have Creator bless us and give us that, that special way. So, I was talking about land issues, and there was a site that, uh, one of the things that I do personally is protection of our Native American burial sites, and I'm well known, noted from that. And then we started out many years ago in New Lenox. There was a uh, um, well, three or four year confrontation now, how many of you have ever heard of the American Indian Movement? Anybody? Okay. Well, the American Indian Movement was something that was born out of desperation. 
and particularly up on the reses out in uh, out in Sioux country uh, with Dickie Wilson and some of the tribal leaders who were being paid off, if you did not uh, adhere to the government policy, you had a drive-by go by, and uh, they, they, they killed hundreds of Native people just for being traditional. So the people had no, nobody to protect them. The government was protecting. In fact, the government was issuing these, these weapons and ammunition to these goon squads, which, which was the tribal police that were uh, under control of the government. You know, and the aim came out, you know, and they, they were rough. You know, we had to protect the people. Now, the problem what we had with that is that the movement started gaining strength. The government started to put spies in there. They wanted to find out who was who, what was going on. And our intention was to protect the people. That was, was the key thing, to protect the people. So when it got to the point where nationally uh, you didn't know everybody that was in the movement, we decided to unhook from that. So we started as the Will County AIM, and we became Midwest Soaring through that. And we were actually able to achieve much more because we knew everybody, everybody was done right. And what I tell our young people, who even today tend to be overzealous, you know, they, they're, not, you know, they're not elders yet, they're not thinking about things. And I always tell people, you know this is true, the power of the heart exceeds the power of the fist. Always. You may win a battle, but you're not going to win the war with the power of the fist. Not, not, where, not where it matters. So oh, since I've been doing what I've been doing, I've been an activist for about 58 years of my life. Uh, I have worked in 37 different states on different issues, uh, up in Canada, a little bit of Hawaii, uh, a little bit of South America. Uh, I was the only native that was ever on the governor's interstate Indian conference. Um, over two or three governors, you know, and as I said before, it's, it's, it's a, a really difficult job trying to inspire the young people, you know, trying to get them moving, you know, and um, I'll talk a little bit about, new, about new, new Lenox. New Lenox was a place that was uh, a little bit near Joliet, and there was a native burial ground there, which was a Miami burial ground. And our intention was to protect that. Now, we knew the park district had intentions of digging the whole thing up, and they were going to build buildings, Olympic-sized pool, and all that. You know, and I, you know, in the beginning, I approached them. I said, we can do something together. We can make this really a good project. You know, but they were determined they were going to try to, to work around me without involving Native people. So what happened was one day we, we called uh, a convoy of, of people to go to uh, uh, park on uh, Forest Preserve on Route 45, and we had a prayer. We had about 150 people, and then from there we went over to to New Lenox in a little a small park there. We rented that, and we had uh, a prayer there. And while we were there, one of the guys for our next stop, he came over and he said, "Joey, he said there's a heavily armed army waiting for you." Now I didn't like the sound of heavily armed, and he told me what was over there. And I looked at our women and our children and our elders. And I got them all together, and I say, you know, I, I don't expect you to go there. They don't know who we are or what we're doing there. They had no idea about our respect for, for the our people. I says, you don't have to go there. You did, a, you did a really good thing coming so far. You know, 150 people, every single one of them, went down at, at Dirt Road. Now, you being spiritual people, you'll understand what I want to say right now, how powerful this is. We're going down this dirt, dirty road. And uh, there's over 150 heavily armed Wally police in the area, shotguns, mirror glasses, the whole thing. There's FBI, there's camera crews. And there's a blockade blocking the entrance to where the burial's at, and which is formerly a, a farm field. And the three of them standing behind there says, well, why are you here today? And I said, we're here today to pray for our ancestors to really disturb in their sleep with that bulldozer. And I pointed at bulldozer. So they went by back there, and they had a little talk, and they come back, and they said to me, they says, we three had decided that we're going to give you the right to pray today. And I stuck my finger in his nose, and I said, no, Creator gave us that right to pray, because you misunderstand me. We're here today to pray for our people. So with that, he went back again, and he comes back over again. He said, well, we decided we're going to move the gate. He says, but we don't want you to desecrate the ground. Now, can you imagine that? not to desecrate the ground. So 
There were some people, you know, since you know, the next, my last generation, who never had the opportunity as Native people to respond to any issue because we were so beaten back, there wasn't anybody championing our issues, there wasn't any aim, there wasn't any, anybody nationally, sorry about that. There wasn't anybody nationally to defend us. So one of those elders was sitting, uh, standing in a wheelchair, she's in a wheelchair next to me, and her name was Helen. And she hadn't got up for many years, she was uh, uh, you know, very ill. And she was so proud of being, being with us. She's in her wheelchair, and I couldn't describe it. She's trying as hard as she could to stand up. And we could have helped her up, but I knew it was important to her that she did that on her own. She was making a statement. So when she finally did stand up, I had a person on the left and a person on the right, and we held her up as she walked that uh, half a block to the site. Now, Archie White, he was a, a Sioux. Uh, he was our medicine person at that time. So what happened is they moved the gate, and we're like four abreast, and we have, we're escorted on, on both sides with these heavily armed people. So we get over to the burial ground, you know, and we're in a circle, you know, and uh, they're around us in uh, two circles. And Archie, he said, he says, grandfather, his grandfather, bless these poor ignorant guards and their family, and he stopped for a second. They went to their side, unclipped their guns, and they're ready to steal. One's hands on the shotgun, one's on the holster. And again, we, we were heavily armed with drums and prayers. Didn't have a sticker or a stone or a mean word. Heavily armed with prayers and drums. So Archie went on again. He says, Grandfather, bless these poor, ignorant guards and their family. And, uh, and they realized that, in fact, he was doing that. And what they did was they clipped their gun, put their mirror glasses off, put their hands behind, and they prayed with us. Now, Archie, uh, he had a wonderful way with people uh, telling the truth, and I believe the Creator blessed his words, what he we did. Um, so that went on to start a, a three-year standing honor guard that we were there every day. Uh, cold, rainy days, We and the people that we had there at the entrance, sometimes we had five, sometimes we had 50. So one time we had the Miami Nation from Indiana came out, a whole bunch of them. And that amount, you know, changed. It kind of made the issue known in the Midwest area that gave people a lot of hope. But there was one day, a few weeks after that, where the mayor says, we're going to have this groundbreaking day. And I called it the shiny shovel day. So he announced the time, so I announced the same time. We're going to do a prayer at the same time. So he put this lie in their papers. He says, Joe Stanabear is planning this arm thing. There's going to be guns. There's going to be all kind of stuff. And I said, no, there's never, ever, ever Native people do a prayer or something. Never uh, any of that. So I told the paper we'd give him uh, his time to do it first, and we would go in afterwards. Now, it came the day of that ceremony, and I still remember looking in the distance, and I seen this whole caravan, the same, all those all those police again, and the FBI and the camera crews, and third, third or fourth car from the front was the mayor. And we had one car there, one car, and the three of us were standing in front of the car, and you could see the car, the mayor's car slows down, and he rolls the window down, and he starts laughing. He goes, one, two, three, you can see him counting, one, two, three. You know, he thought it was real funny, there's three of us. Well, he went in there, and they had the ceremony, and when he come out, it wasn't so funny because I had both sides of the highway lined as far as you can see in both directions. And our people just stood there and we looked at him. Now during that time there, there were many things that uh, uh, these people that were in that area, they had kind of the good old boy mentality. They did many things that were trying to discredit us. Uh, you know, one of the things they did was one day it was a really hot day and this truck pulls up. And I knew right away this guy was not one of ours. He said, oh, I bet you guys are really thirsty. And he popped us up there, and there's a lot of beer and ice. And I see up down about a half a block away, there's a guy with a camera. I walked over to that, that back of that thing, and I slammed that thing down. I says, get the heck out of here. Not quite those words, but get the heck out of here. Um, and there were many things of that nature that they did. And I was ever vigilant 
that that did not happen. Uh, everything we did was the right way. You know, and it, it grew a strong solidarity between our people and you know, from a long distance away. There was an orange fence that went around there, you know, and the people that would come and go would put prayer ties on there from different states. And this prayer, prayer fence had many, many prayers on there. Uh, you know, just thinking back, some of those people, most of them have passed away since then. But it, that journey has taken me on many different places. Uh, uh, what Midwest Story stands for, Save Our Ancestors, Remains, and Resources, and Dentist Network Group. So any of the issues that cover our people, uh, we try to get involved in as best we can, uh, as best the money will stretch. Um, we've saved something on the order of 1,900 acres since I started of Illinois. Uh, we work with Pat Quinn, uh, say Plum Island with the Audubon, uh, Sierra Club rather, and uh, we were able to save that. Um, so what we do is we win battle, one one battle, we move on to the next, move on to the next. So our headquarters right now, we're located down in uh, Lockport. Uh, we're in the 1860 train station. I always say call before, and I have some uh, brochures over the kitchen interested in that. Uh, so we are open on Wednesdays and Fridays and Saturdays, but always call first. And locally, I'm very happy to say that uh, tomorrow we have a meeting with the uh, Glen Ellen uh, members of the uh, their, their people over there. And for seven months, we've been working with trying to get the lease for the McKee House. Now, the McKee House is on 263 acres. Uh, it's got trees that are 150 years old. Had never been cut down. It's got some village sites that were there many, many years ago. And uh, we're going to try to raise up $2 million to redo the inside, which uh, needs a lot of work, needless to say. We're trying to do some programming. So we hope that we're able tomorrow to finally get this contract nailed down. And, you know, it's, it's not easy to... Uh, every, every penny we get, we try to use as extremely wisely as we can. Now... I mentioned before about how we try to, and pardon one minute, I don't know how much time, am I getting close on time? Okay, good. Uh, I'm told we're going to do two or three different sessions during the year, so that'll be good. So I, that's way too much material to cover in one time, but that's trying to glaze over some of the things. So again, I, I was talking about how do we inspire our young people? You know, and it was, uh, I believe it was the year 2000. We were at a powwow. And a woman come over to me and says, I'm a member of the Plain Dirt uh, Garden Club. We want to partner with you. So she started talking, and what she said I you know, thought sounded pretty good. So it was this Navy Pier Flower and Plant Show, big, big show downtown. So we did a, they had all native plants that were full bloom. We had a waterway. We had a waterfall. We had a living village. We had uh, people on the set, you know, dressed. Um, and we got viewed by, I think it was 170,000 people during that, that time. It gave us a lot of notoriety and a lot of uh, contacts. But what it gave us the most, we won the top four awards. Now bear in mind, this is the major thing for the growers and people who, uh, is their business to try to have the best for their promoting their business. And to have all volunteers win the top four awards. And the judges says, you know, this thing was so fantastic that we wanted to give you all 10, but they didn't because they couldn't risk that uh, loss of revenue from the rest of the people. You know, it was kind of funny because we were pretty, pretty uh, close with them, you know, uh, the, the garden club. And they said, we want you to come out next year. And uh, we got this idea. We're going to have like this ancient setting with a, like, like a mammoth. And we want you guys to dress like cavemen. You know, we're not cavemen, you know. So I declined respectfully on that, and, uh, you know, that's where that went with that. But getting people's awareness on, on issues that are pretty well hidden, and they are hidden. The press has got this unstated thing that uh, they do not report hardly anything that happens on the res. Now, if that's not so, how many of you guys have heard anything about a res this year? Okay, how about the last five years? When Columbine had that, uh, uh, that massacre to happen, we had a similar thing to happen on one of the reses up north, and there was a few more kids. One day in the news, 
Now the Columbine thing went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Anything that has anything with Native people, generally you don't hear anything about it at all unless you're in that particular area and you might hear something on it. So bringing awareness to these issues is a pretty hard thing to do. Um, now you might wonder you know, about uh, how I deal with the remain issue. You know, many years ago, and most of you are old enough to remember when the newspapers reported anything they found, it was all skeletons. We found X amount of skeletons. And one day the uh, United Press uh, called me and they said, how do you feel about the word skeleton? I said, no. I said, I don't care what nation or what people they belong to, they're not skeletons. These are human remains. And I was the one to change that from skeletons in the newspaper. You almost never see that. These are human remains. I don't care what people they come from. So that was something that was a major win for us on that too. Uh, even taking uh, the squall out of anything that has a squall name in this state. Um, and I won't go into what that means, but it's not, it's not an Indian woman. It's a very derogative sexual term. So we were, I believe there's no squaw name left in this state. So we took that off. Um, but all these things, as you might imagine, they don't happen in a day or two or three. You know, it needs a lot of grassroots support and, you know, and uh, a lot of effort. Our first time down at Springfield, and this is the truth, it just, I, I still think of this and it makes me laugh. I mean, it makes me laugh. They had a Senate hearing, we had an important issue. So they decided they were gonna have, have a Senate hearing and uh, they said, we're going to allow you guys three speakers. Well, two minutes apiece. Now, this is an important issue. Two minutes apiece, three speakers. So the first one started speaking. He finished. And I noticed one of the senators started wrapping her fingers. And the person got halfway through. And she stood up. And she, her exact words were, what more do you people want? We put you on the nickel. Now, can you imagine that? What more do you people want? We put you on the nickel. Now recently in Oklahoma, over a long land issue, and I thought it was uh, kind of, uh, I don't know where the word comical or not, but kind of ironic. Uh, the tribe got back a huge section of the land and they had all the press was out there and these farmers were going, they're taking our land. How dare they take our land? And I'm going, yeah, I know, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, taking their land. Well, anyway, so the thing of it is, is to keep our, our children motivated. Uh, we do hand out scholarships uh, at least two or three a year. Uh, and as you might imagine, I take those scholarships pretty seriously. Uh, I don't do any favoritism of that. Uh, we take the applications in, you know, and it might surprise you. I don't go for the A student. I go for the person that I think is going to be the best tribal leader. So every applicant I get, I call, we have long conversations, and I say, well, how come your grades are this way now and they were that way then? What was the change? What, what made that happen? You know, and uh, normally on the res, it's normally living situations, either parents that were abusive or alcoholic or something, you know, and uh, that, that student that comes from a, a D level or F level and it goes up to an A, I'm interested in that person because they have persevered and they have proved their worth. Now, someone who's got an A student, I grant you that they're trying hard and they're doing good, but they're probably going to find a job pretty easy, a lot easier than, than the person that's not. So I'm more geared towards activism, uh, what they're doing and what they're doing it for and, and why they're doing it for. Uh, that, to me, is a real important thing. And uh, I have to say, for all the scholarships I've handed out over the years, sorry, and it's handed out, that um, almost all one, uh, these people have persevered and have proven their worth. So I'm very proud that uh, we did our part and still doing our part. Uh, last year, we had Comcast Foundation that gave us $5,000 to hand out five this year. And uh, when we have the um, summer solstice down at McKee, now that'll be on June 19th. Uh, it'll be 11 o'clock, and I try to highlight different Native people. So this June, what we're going to have, we're going to have, the, have uh, half of the At Aztec dance troupe come out. So you're going to see an Aztec prayer out there. It's, it's a prayer for the, the season change. 
you know, and uh, that's something that I want people to see that, you know, of the 350 languages we once had, we only have 150 left right now. The other 200 are extinct, they're gone. You know, and um, you know, we're trying to hang on to what we have. Uh, some of the schools, I have to laugh, because uh, uh, you know, they say we're trying to give the kids an immersion where we want to teach them 10 words a year. You know, 10 words, it's not gonna quite do it. You know, so we want to have, you know, progress on that. In a native school, a native meeting, if you were to go to, uh, like right now I'm watching you, if we were to go, if you were to go to a native uh, tribal meeting or a native meeting of any sort, you would know it's something drastically different than what you're doing. Our people, which I do myself, is we're taught never to look, very seldom look at your people. You know, we look to different ways and we're listening with our heart, you know, with our spirit. And we feel that by continually looking at you, we're challenging you, we're, we're confronting you. So we will glance at you momentarily, you know, but we don't overly look at you. You know, and that's one of the things you would think, well, gee, they're not listening. Well, we are listening, we are, we are watching. You know, there's a lot of stuff that Native people do that's exactly opposite of what you would do. For instance, a handshake. Now, in the European way, a man goes and a man, we want to crush each other's hand, you know, crush that hand. Yeah, we don't do that. If you're an elder, but you want someone to come out and put your hand in your hand and shake it respectfully, but we're not out to try to break your fingers. You know, we could do that, but we don't want to do that. We want to just respect you. You know, and that real word, respect, um, of all the thousands of kids I've taught over the years, when I go to a classroom, I often ask, you know, the young people, what important word starts with L? And almost always you see the hand rise up and they all say love. And I said, that's good. And then I go, what important word starts in the R? I've had two students raise their hand that got the word respect. And that's part of the problem we have today is that that respect is not there. You know, I don't know if it comes in a video or it comes from parents that are too busy or, or what's, what's going on with that. But to Native people, there's two words that starts with an with a R that are extremely important. And that is reverence and respect. We have, I, I respect everything that I see. I want to be a friend at everything I see, unless they prove to be elsewise. I would rather extend, extend my hand, you know. And that reverence, you know, getting up in the morning and uh, looking at the gifts the Creator has put down for all of us, you know, how, how often do you do that, you know, every day, every morning? I get up and I look at those trees and I watch the season change and I watch the green bloods. Now the green bloods are the, are the plants and anything that has chloroform, that's their blood, the green bloods, you know. And sometimes people say, well, gee, uh, Native people are all heathen. No, that's not true. You know, uh, we're not all heathen and not, not heathen at all, in fact. When we're praying outside, uh, say if we're outside, we have a ceremony, we're praying for the gifts that the Creator has put there. Now you may call him God or whatever name you want to put it. We call Creator. Same thing, same thing. You know, and and I often tell people, you know, you know, we have a keen respect for our families, for the military, for veterans, uh, for all the things that matter. And I say, how are we different than you? You know, we're the same thing, same thing. You know, and uh, and speaking of military, we have uh, the highest amount of any uh, people that have served in the military. We have about 80% of our people, believe it or not, men and women, have served in the military. Now that might surprise you when you consider what this country's done, but if you were to go to powwow and you were to knock over a flag, you would start a commotion because we respect, not necessarily the flag, what that flag has done to us, but we respect this country, which we still protect. We're protecting this land for all of us. You know, so I want you to make uh, no mistake on that. Even, even the code talkers, uh, they were responsible for saving many lives with, you know, using their language, which the Japanese couldn't crack. But they were not aware of why they were there, really. They had a military Marine Guard, and they didn't know this until after the war. But if that Marine felt that that uh, Navajo, was, or Hopi, was going to get captured, they were to kill that person. They didn't know that. They didn't want that code out, and they didn't, they didn't tell the guys, this guy is here not to save your life. He's here to kill you if you're going to get captured. 
Now, I knew several of the cold talkers, you know, most of them have all passed away, and I think there's one or two left, you know, but they did that with uh, a good heart, and uh, I don't know how they would have felt about that had they known the truth at the beginning of the whole thing, but, you know, uh, that's the truth of it, you know. Um, so I know I bounced around a little bit, you know, and we've got a little bit of time here, but, you know, this, this journey has taken me many places. Uh, you know, I do namings, I do land acknowledgments, I did... Uh, Loyola University last last week or two weeks ago, and we did a land acknowledgement over there. And it was one of the Franciscans. Uh, we we the reason I went there is they wanted a, they they wanted a land acknowledgement, which we did, you know. And they also wanted uh, somebody in the school was kind of protesting that mural that was in the library there. And they had this in the central library. There is this big mural, twenty foot by maybe thirty foot high, you know, and uh, I went there and I went there early and I put I put a I put a chair there and I sat there for a half hour. I was looking at that mural intently, every part of it. I wanted to see what that mural was about. And a lot of the students thought that um, uh, it represented um, church over the people. And I looked at it and knowing some of the stories that I do. I looked at it, and I, I gave the mural a fair shake. So when the conference started, we had four or five people. I had a student body. Uh, we had a Franciscan who was sitting next to me. And because he knew my history, he was sitting next to me, and he, he was, like, shaking. He didn't know what I was going to say about it. And I started out by saying this, which I say to you, too. Not one of us can change the past. It's flowed along. It's done its course. But today and tonight, we can change tomorrow. And I know that's true if we want to. So I told him, I said, you know, the people in those days, they didn't have uh, any, any military choice after a while. They didn't have any say-so, you know, and I just asked the Franciscan, I says, did any one of those people in any of those tribes over the Great Lakes ask you to be there? And he said, no. I said, you were assuming that our people were not worthy, that we didn't have our own culture, that we didn't have our own spirituality. And again, I say, we believe in Creator, you know. And protecting that site in New Lenox, there was an elder there, um, Laura, Laura Shelders. She was the last fluent Miami-speaking person. And she told me something interesting. She says, it's, it was passed down through our word of people they said, the person, Jesus Christ, he came to that site long before Europe, and he came there and he talked to the people. You know, so they, they had a good belief in, in that, you know. You know and uh, a spiritual person, if you do something the right way, is always a good thing. And unfortunately, not everybody has got a good heart, and they have their own motives, and they change things for their own purpose. You know, but if you're a spiritual person, you're here, I know you're here, spiritual people, and that's your leader here. And I can still see from his eyes, he's a good man. You know, he's not going to steer you the wrong way. And that's true. I've seen many, many good leaders over the past. As I said before, we don't need less. We need more. We need more good leaders. We need more people sitting in, the, in, these, in these pews. You know, and it's not any one person's job. It's, it's all of our jobs. You know, the kids should be listening. The kids should be learning. The kids should be doing things, you know. You know, and, uh, you know, we're going through this cultural change, and some of the change is uh, good, and some of them maybe are not good. You know, that's each, each for each congregation to determine their direction. But it wants to be a place where the family can come and, and, and pray and have community together and enjoy yourself together and do what you have to do in a good way, because that's important. It is. So anyway, going back to, uh, to Star Rock, when we won that uh, and it become, uh, Plum Island become part of the park, uh, now it's a dedicated eagle sanctuary, and we had this big ceremony for Pat Quinn, and we gave him a blanket and some different things. Now, I believe that I mean, we had the left, we have the right, and people get so stuck on either side of that. There was a time when the uh, Second War, when whether it was Kennedy or it was Bush, people were fighting for this country. They were Americans. And I'm not sure what happened to change that, but it shouldn't be, you know, them, it should be us together, uh, respectful of each other's uh, different ways. 
And as I said before, there's no wrong way to pray if you pray from your heart. It's got to come from that heart. You know, and I've been to some churches, and I don't, I don't see that here, but I've been to some churches where half the people are sitting there and they're dozing away. You know, and I don't know why. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a sacred thing to come together, you know, spend that time together. Well, anyway, <clears throat> so I've seen a lot of different uh, things happen, a lot of different people, and, and some of the things you see will break your heart. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've done namings and at funerals, and, um, you know, it's, it's, you know <laughs> the problem with there's so very few elders left that know anything that a lot of different tribes that don't have an elder anymore in this state or in the area, and you know, they call me to do their ceremony. And I always tell them I can do it in the way I, I best know in my way, and I'll try to adhere to your way a little bit. But uh, there's no one native exactly the same way we do things. We're all different on, on how we do it. So this was something that was kind of interesting. It was called to do a funeral uh, in Indiana. You know, and uh, a friend of mine would pull up in the yard, and there's, and there's yards in the farm country. It's all full of family. And I talked to the family, and I said, well, what would a grandma like? And I got to know her through what they were saying about her. You know, and then I said, well, where did your grandma, you know, where does she want to be, you know, thrown in the wind to? She said, well, she loved that hill over there. In the distance, about a mile away, there was a great big hill. It had oaks growing around there. So I said, okay, everybody get in the car. And we rode down the road and over the barbed wire fence, and we're standing in this oak grove, and it's high in this hill. And I'm looking at them, I'm looking at the ground, I'm looking at the wind. And I said, this is the spot you want, and they said, yes, it is. So we did the ceremony, and uh, off Grandma goes in the wind. But just at that second, there was a terrible downdraft. Whew. And I'm looking where Grandma went. And I, I, have, <laughs> I was very hesitant to look at them because Grandma was now part of the cow pie. So, <laughs> so I'm looking at them, and... They, they knew I felt uncomfortable, and all of a sudden they all bust out laughing, you know. And sometimes it's funny like that, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's terrible, you know, terrible times. But, you know, over the years I've handled many different people, many different situations, uh, uh, even with the reburials. Uh, there's only three of us know where the remains go to, and that's, that's Creator, the spirits, and myself, you know. And I try to put the remains back in places that won't be disturbed again. And that's very important to me. Uh, whenever I handle any new land issue, I'm very careful to instruct the people that own that land, do not highlight the mounds or the burial ground, anything about them. Don't talk about them because people are going to come out and they're going to loot them because they had this stupid curiosity that somehow we're aphrodisiacs or something, you know, and uh, I do my best um, to hide them, you know. Um, I can tell you many stories about that, too. There was a, oh, I won't tell you what college town, but there was this uh, dentist, and his uh, son was also a dentist. You know, and the father had died, passed away. And uh, the son inherited a house. Now, him, he had a much younger girlfriend. And he had this really strange thing in which he would, they'd go to the house at night, they'd do everything they had, you know, cutting the grass. It was always late at hours. The light was never on, even though it was right in the middle, middle of town. And he, he had money. So one day he says to his girlfriend, he says, I'm going to write this note. And we're going to the cabin by the lake. And I'm going to set myself on fire. And when I've totally incinerated I read myself, I want you to give this note to the police. And he did, and she did. And the police come out, and uh, they looked at him, and he was surely incinerated. And they took the note, and uh, they, de they declared that the house was now, uh, uh, had to be cleaned out. Well, the house had 30, 30 remains that were hidden in walls and all kind of stuff that was hidden. So I went there with the intention of blessing the house and to release uh, some of that negativity. You know, and the guard who was watching the house, he said, why don't you come down to the city hall and down to the police station, the crime lab, and we want to show you some of the things we got. Well, they had like these three big toilet paper-sized boxes full of skulls. There were 30 skulls. And... Uh, I looked at them, and I, you know, having a knowledge of the anatomy, you know, and patina and things, I knew pretty much, you know, how old they were and who they were. You know, one of them had the skull cut in half and used that for an ashtray, which greatly uh, angered me. So after I told them all that, 
they had this cabinet, and he opens this drawer, and he puts this aluminum tin foil about that big around, about that long, and he puts this on top of the, the, the cabinet, and he rolls it out. He said, we can't figure out what this is. So I'm looking at him, looking at that, and I said, as you guys are a crime lab? He goes, yes, we can't figure that out. I said, that was somebody's face that was shaved off, and it's not one of ours. So with that, he looked extra hard, and he realized that it was. And he, he said, don't tell anybody about it. So I've been telling everybody for years now. <laughs> but anyway, what happened with that, because of that, we, there wasn't any living relatives still alive. So we had the mother exhumed, and the DNA did not match the supposedly son. So I, I covered a murder. And that's not the only one I've covered over the years, but that's you know, one of our stories I tell. So many people try to get away with doing different things, and... And I'm very careful that when we get involved in anything, that there's ne never any negativity to it. Uh, I value our sorry name very greatly, and I'm never ever going to be uh, bought off or or do something not in the right way. That name was too hard fought by too many people. Um, many many people that they gave everything they had to get us as far as we are, and I, I respect that. So I know we're getting kind of short on time here, and I don't want to belabor you. Um, Let's see what kind of time we got here. Okay. Now, I hope uh, I didn't offend anybody. If I did, I did not intend to. But you need to know the truth, you know, and you need to respect your building here and, and your leader here. And I, I respect him. I can tell he's a good man. I like that. You know, I, I'm always happy to see that. I worked a lot with um, the Methodist Northern Conference over the years. And some of my people, which are anti-religion they go why are you doing that with all the stuff that would happen in sand creek and all that and again i told them the same thing we can't change yesterday but today we're going to change tomorrow and do you know because of my friendship with uh, many of the methods over a wide area uh their support of our powwow uh scholarships uh special things that come our way because they realize that that's the way to change things is to make things better so um I am a very strong believer in putting that hand out there, you know, to, to make friends. It's, it's going to make a better world. You know, what we're going to do globally, I don't know. I have, I have fears that some idiot someplace is going to press a button. You know, and most of us are just regular people. You know, we don't have any say in that, you know, you know, other than praying for a better future, better leaders. And I don't know why, with all the billions of people we have on this planet, we get stuck with people that we got on top. I mean, if that's the best we got, something is not going right. <laughs> something is not happening, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I, I believe in the best person for the best job. There's good people on the left. There's good people on the right. And there's also bad people on the left and the right. And to know, which we do all know that, there's millionaires on both sides of it. So, you know, we had really have to judge, you know, not listen to the media, but listen to what we see and what we hear and, and see if they're walking their talk. And walking your talk is a real important thing. If you say you're going to do something, you do that thing. You don't change it or modify it because the flavor of the time has changed. You know, you, you stand up for what you believe in and you do that. Well, I've spoken for an hour now, and I don't hope I didn't, haven't bored you too much, but uh, I just am happy that I've been here today and uh, hope to come again. Uh, I'd like to hear some questions, and I'll try to answer the best of my ability. So do we have some questions there? Come on, hands up. And now I'm a little bit harder hearing, so speak up. Step forward. Step. All right. Uh, you mentioned the McKean. You mentioned the McKean building, the house, and the property that is on it. Nope. Do you have any idea what that is? Do you have any idea what that is? No, it's the, it's not the Forest Preserve itself. The Forest Preserve owns the land. Joseph, could you repeat the question just so people on Zoom can hear it? Uh, We're asking about if uh, the McKee, the land in McKee House is part of the deal, and is not. It's 263 acres, you know, and that land belongs to the Forest Preserve. They take great care of it, you know, and ours is just a footprint of the, of the house and the driveway and out front. And we're more than happy with that. So we have no intentions, and nor would we have chopping any trees down or any clearing. We want to keep it just the way it is. Well, the key house was roughly made about 1936 by WPA. You know, if you look at that limestone, it's a, kind of a special job they did. And for those who probably not been on the inside, 
the outside is uh, uh, it's in pretty good shape by and large. It needs a little clean, but nothing drastic. It uh, does need doors and windows, and because of the roof leaking, which now there's a tarp on the roof, um, there is quite a bit of work that needs to be done. Uh, there's mold, asbestos, lead paint. So all that is pretty expensive to mediate, uh, so that has to be come out of there. Uh, so we're trying to raise up two or three million dollars, which will be rehabbing of the house and also some funding for programs in the future. Um, one of the problems that we're going to have because of that building being that large, you might imagine the heating and air conditioning bill. And somebody suggested to me, said, well, you guys don't need no air conditioning. Uh, I told him, I said, no, that's not true. You know, I know I, know I need it because <laughs> I'm going to die of the heat. You know, we have uh, different artifacts and things that uh, are temperature fragile. Uh, I have a 1937 Bald Eagle, a Golden Eagle rather, that was given to us. You know, and things like that that need to be in a temperature controlled climate. Um, many of the artifacts that we have in the building or will have in the building are one-of-a-kind stuff, you know, and at first we had a debate whether um, the building would be open to everybody. And I said what I want to do is really do the out small building, it's going to be the classrooms, open for many different clubs and people that do many things. But the inside, because we're going to have our artifacts in our office, uh, we'll, we'll have to be, staff will have to be in the building uh, when those people do visit. But I'm, we don't want to have 10,000 10, keys floating around. Uh, you wouldn't want someone coming to your house and going through your drawers and taking stuff out, and, and we, don't, we don't want it either, you know. Things happen. So I hope I, hope I answered your question. So this is, this is going to be a museum? I mean, it'll be a gallery. It'll be a museum. It'll be a place to do special programming. Um, many, many different things that are going to be unique. It's going to be a model for the Midwest states. You know, it's not going to be a little low-class thing. It's going to be a model, a beacon. Where and is I, this house? Where is this property? Where? 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 Uh, if you're on St. Charles Road, uh, I believe the address is 1104. Okay. It's that big limestone building. And it's part of the big forest preserve? Right. You can't possibly miss it. It's been there for a long, long time. Uh, questions? Anybody? Well, land acknowledgement is a really important thing, and I'm doing a lot of those in the last six months. And I think this uh, thing with the COVID and the BLM and things like that have happened um, changed people's hearts a little bit. Now, I'm a strong believer, and that's the whole teaching by itself, that all four colors are equal. So I don't support just one color. I support all the colors. When we highlight just one, we're not realizing that all of them are equally sacred. And that's the way I was raised. It's on my shirt here. I've got the medicine wheel. It's the circle here. And if you notice, those four colors of mankind are all equal. It's what mankind did to make them unequal. It wasn't creator. The mankind made them unequal. So we're very... Um, it's the way I live my life. I, I believe in that. So that's, that's, you know, okay. Any more questions? Did that answer that completely? So the question was, so the land acknowledgments. Uh, oh, yeah. That you did at Loyola, like, so when you do land acknowledgments, what does that involve and, and where does that go? Well, what you're doing is giving thanks to all the people that were here. Now, what typically the main mistake that most people do trying to craft that is they always, they read, they do a little bit of reading, they go, we thank the Potawatomi. Now the Potawatomi are my language group, the Algonquin speaking people. And I tell them, no, don't do that. They're just the last. For the last 15, 20,000 years of the countless hundreds of tribes that passed through and lived there, you don't want to thank just one, one, one tribe. You want to thank all the indigenous nations that ever lived there whose remains are part of that soil, all the people. So that, what that land acknowledgement is, it's actually uh, acknowledging that you know, something was taken and that at least an apology should be given 
in realizing that other people love this place uh, severely. Now, when, when I talk about that, I want to mention something about that too, just, just briefly. When you think about Native people, we never had a dump, never had toxics, never had a jail, um, never had taxes, never had politicians other than a chief. And if the chief wasn't good, the tribe voted him out by not supporting him. And all the things that we have today, we didn't have then. And I'm wondering how could we degress so far, you know, and, and call ourselves, uh, I don't know, civilized, I guess, I don't know. You know, having the respect, and again, I say the word reverence and respect, truly feeling that in your heart when you see something and being generally glad to see a friend or something. And, you know, I see many families that, uh, you know, they have family outings and before the end of the uh, outing, the parents are half sloshed. Now, I don't drink, I don't, uh, I don't smoke, don't do any drugs, don't want them. You know, Creator gave me this body to take care of, and uh, I may eat a little much, but, <laughs> but uh, I'm not going to take away that gift from what it should be. Those young people, they watch what you do. You know, if you're acting not in a good manner, you're imprinting that on them. You know, and there's no thing about that. You are their teacher. You know, each one of us is a beacon. Each one of us is a beacon. You know, if you're shining dimly, well, that doesn't speak well of, you know, the energy that you're projecting, you know, shine bright, do, do something good. Woulda, coulda, shoulda, don't do it, you know, do it. Get out there, move around. I don't care what you're doing, whether you're gardening or recycling or whatever you're doing, do it, you know, do it. If, if your neighbor's not recycling, so what, recycle. You know, if you wanna plant some pollinators and give something to the butterflies and bees, do it, you know. You know, you gotta judge what you feel is important you know, don't be afraid to do it. Don't be afraid to be a human being. Do not be afraid to be a human being, what you should be. Each one of you. Each one of you. So any more questions? I have a flaky question from yeah, behind you. Know. Come closer. Um, I'm, I'm not hearing you. Is that me? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, He's I have, got somebody I have a in flaky there. question. So is there a question for, on Zoom? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Um, my question is kind of flaky. I wondered whether indigenous people would be willing to share songs with outsiders, or are they too personal, too much grounded in experience to share? But if they are shared, how would, how would an outsider go about learning some of these songs? So the question was, are there songs that can be shared, or is that too sacred of a, of a sharing? Ah, that's a good question. There's a long been a debate between our people and those that want to follow our ways, how much should be taught and how much shouldn't be taught. And I think that when you're a spiritual person, for you not to teach somebody else what you know, you're not acknowledging that special, that special gift. There were, uh, so many people have misappropriated a sweat lodge. And what a sweat lodge is, it's a place that uh, in the past, is a place where certain families have had people in there that uh, endured the sweat lodge as suffering for the people. You know, and if you come out of a sweat lodge and you're happy and you're laughing and you're giggling, you haven't been there for the right reason. And it's not a place that you're going to come out uh, in a comical or, or, or happy way. You're, you're suffering for the people. You know, and there's certain things that if a sweat lodge is being done appropriately uh, will happen. Um, certain feelings that will happen. Um, there was some people on one of the reses, I won't say where it was, but they knew that people were questing for this experience for a sweat lodge. So we had these buses full of people would come and the sweat lodge is generally pretty low where you have to crawl into a door. You know, and there's rocks that are heating outside and every so often the door opens up and more rocks are heated on with water and it's a pretty, pretty hot thing. So what he was doing, he had the people go in there fully dressed. He had a big fire in there, a plastic tent, and he charged them ungodly amounts of money to stand there and then walk through. 
But any ceremony, if any elder or any person doing that ceremony charges you, it's not the real thing. There is never a charge for any ceremony. What we do is we acknowledge that leader or that, that place, and we may pass something along to that person, but that person never asks for anything. We automatically acknowledge that and, and, and give that freely, um, you know, just for that reason. You know, um, I'm very careful where I go with my spirituality. You know, and, and I feel spiritual here. I, I feel a gift here. Even my own church, you know, uh, I feel that, you know, that spirit there. Uh, if I go out west, I'm standing on a butte looking out the mountains. I feel that same feeling. Uh, if I'm at a cemetery with my wife, you know, I feel the same feeling. You know, if you're a spiritual feeling, as a being, you're going to feel that no matter where you go. That's part of who you are. And if you don't feel that, you need to ask yourself why. Why am I not feeling that? You know, and that might lead you on an interesting journey, and who knows where that journey is going to take you. But you should feel that same way everywhere. I remember when Gandhi uh, died as a little little kid, and uh, it was I think it was it was Delhi, and he was wrapped up in like this cocoon, you know, and he uh, he floated from hand to hand to hand, and there was I don't know how many thousand people were there, but his remains just went all the way around. Now, he was he was loved by the people. But his own family were not too crazy about him because he was always gone helping the people. So it's kind of ironic that uh, uh, a price you pay doing what you love to do and what you're, what you're, what you're prone to do, and sometimes it has um, hard family consequences. Uh, you know, speaking for myself and the people that do what I do, there's very few of us that are still doing the remains and probably the last in this state that handles the remains. You know, and uh, Marie Pearson was yanked in Sioux. She was uh, one of my elders that I learned much from. Now, when her husband worked for IDOT, uh, they had a cemetery they went into. They were gonna, they were gonna move the road. You know, so what happened was uh, all the uh, non-native uh, people that were interred got reburied in another cemetery with coffins and the few native people they found that were there before the whites, they got put in, put in museums. So she protested that. She walked barefoot across from uh, uh, state to, I mean, side to side of the state. And she was able to create four cemeteries for our people. And she's also the cultural aide for three or four governors. Um, it's people like that that uh, stood up for the people that really sacrificed their life, you know, sacrificed their life. And Martin, I apologize. I'm a little hard of hearing. I'm trying to get a hearing aid. I don't, don't have it yet. So I'm trying to hear what you're saying. But, you know, I hope I answered that question okay. Is that good? Okay. Yeah. Anything else? No? Well, I, I think, you know, we, we've uh, invited you here for an hour and we've got to do more than that. So <laughs> we, we um, and you did say uh, we talked about having you back. Uh, I would like to. How do you feel about that? Do you want to learn some more things? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. And again, it was not my intention to say anything to hurt anybody, but these are things that I speak from the truth, and you need to know because what one color goes through, all can go through, you know. We must protect freedom, and the only way to do that is to stand up and, you know. Thank you. Well, you've given us words to hold on to, like respect and reverence. Um, our heart and our spirit uh, and the creator and those are all gifts. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Zoom people, thank you too. So for those on Zoom, there are some brochures here in person. You can come get them. Um, they'll be in the narthex if we have extras, and if we don't, we'll get more. And um, I don't know if we have a date when you'll be back, but we will, um, do we have a date? No, not yet, I see some heads going, but we will get one and we'll get that publicized. Yeah, all right, thank you Zoom people, good night. <laughs>